Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Richard Yero. I'm a fellow at the Mosavar Ramani Center for Business and Government. And thank you for joining us this evening. This discussion is hosted by the Mosavar Ramani Center at Harvard Kennedy School, as well as the Fairbank Center and Program on US-Japan Relations at Harvard University. Today, policymakers in China are trying to mitigate a bubble in Chinese real estate markets. To better understand the effects of China's bubble and the policies to mitigate the bubble, tonight's discussion will take a closer look at Japan. In the 1980s, Japan's economy was growing quickly alongside extraordinary growth in Japan's real estate sector. By 1990, residential land prices in Tokyo were nearly three times what they were in 1985 and a few blocks in Tokyo was said to be worth more than all the land in California put together. In the 1990s, Japan's property markets collapsed, bringing long-term pain to Japan's economy. What caused the bubble in Japan's property markets? Could Japan's authorities have acted any differently to stop the bubble from growing or to minimize economic pain after the bubble burst? How similar are the trends in China's real estate sector with past events in Japan? And what can China learn from Japan's experience? As China seeks to revive growth after the pandemic, these questions could prove vital to China's economic future. Tonight's three speakers bring decades of experience on monetary policy, financial system, and financial systems in Japan and China. We'll begin the discussion with their presentations, followed by a moderated question and answer session. Members of the audience may use the Q&A feature on Zoom below to submit questions, either by name or anonymously. And with that, uh, Jinlin Lee will introduce our speakers. Hi, I'm Jinlin Lee, a postdoc at Howard Kennedy School. Oh. Yeah, hello, I'm Jinlin Lee, a postdoc at Howard Kennedy School. We are thrilled to have a fascinating lineup to discuss the topic. Tokyo Hoshi is a professor at University of Tokyo. His research area includes corporate finance, banking, monetary policy, and the Japanese economy. His past affiliations include Stanford University and University of California, San Diego. His books include the Japanese economy and the political economy of the Anbei administration, and economics reforms. Paul Sheard is an Australian American economist and the author of the forthcoming book, The Power of Money. He is the former vice chairman of SMP Global and former senior fellow at Harvard Kennedy School. He held global chief economist positions at SMP Global, SMP Rating Services, Numera Securities, and Lehman Brothers and faculty positions at Australian National University and Osaka University. Sheard was appointed by two prime ministers in Japan to serve on Economic Advisory Committee of the Japanese Economy. Wei Xiong is John H. Scali, 66, professor in finance and professor of economics at Princeton University. His research interests center on capital market imperfections, behavioral finance, digital economy, and the Chinese economy. He has recently edited the Handbook of China's Financial System, which is published by Princeton University Press in 2020. Our three guests will take turns to share their views chronologically. Takeo, firstly, will primarily discuss Japan's real estate bubble from the perspective of Japan addressing external imbalances in the 1980s and 90s. Then Paul will discuss Japan's policy after the real estate bubble burst and what policies could have better mitigated the 90s crisis with an eye to parallels with China's real estate market conditions. Then we will share how he views China's parallels or potential lessons to be learned from Japan's real estate market condition. Then we will have a Q&A session. Now to Q, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jinlin, and thank you, Richard. And uh, let me 
share some slides that I prepared. And uh, can are you looking at my slides? Okay. Okay. As uh, Richard and uh, Jin Lin mentioned, uh, we are asking these questions: uh, What happened in Japan, and what are lessons to the China? And Jin Lin uh, kindly introduced my recent book on Abenomics reforms, but I have uh, an, an, another book uh, which, which I want to start by pro promote spot, spot by part uh, by promoting that book, uh, the textbook on the Japanese economy with Takatoshi Ito, and that was published in English in 2020, and now it's available in Chinese and Japanese, uh, Japanese one uh, came, came last uh, this month. And uh, there's a chapter 14 called The Lost Decade, which uh, traces uh, the, the, the tr trouble the Japanese economy has had since uh, late 1990s. Uh, what, what happened uh, traces, traces the problems back to the bubble economy and the collapse. So uh, many of the questions we will be asking today, for Japan at least, uh, we try to answer those questions in chapter 14 of our book. So if uh, some of the audiences are interested in uh, getting into more about the Japanese experience, I highly recommend to pick up uh, any of these uh, editions and uh, look at the chapter 14. Now uh, I focus on the first two part, uh, what caused Japan's price bubble and how could it have been prevented? So we, I, I focus on the uh, creation of the bubble um, and the growth of the bubble. And here are my short answers. And as, as I said, uh, there's a more detailed version, more nuanced version in my textbook. So I hope uh, many of you can have a chance to look at that. So the first what caused Japan's price bubble, especially property uh, price bubble, uh, which is the uh, focus of our discussion today? And there are many explanations based on the fundamentals, uh, like uh, loose monetary policy, the low interest rate, uh, and, and others. Uh, but the, those explanations are basically, the, the, it, th those are based on fundamentals. And the, since the bubble is really the deviation from the fundamental, and I think what happened in Japan is really a uh, bubble, uh, as uh, Jin Lin mentioned, or Jin Lin or Richard mentioned, I forgot w which one pointed out. But uh, at one point, um, the land price or the value of the imperial palace in Japan was uh, equal to the land price of California, uh, uh, the California, or, or all of the California. And that sounded not like uh, coming from fundamental. So uh, any explanation based on fundamentals, like uh, change in interest rate, uh, I think we should be uh, suspect. We, we, we should suspect. We, we, we should doubt. And I think it, what happened in Japan, the Japanese land price was indeed the deviation from the fundamentals and caused by the expectation of ever-increasing asset prices. The Japanese economy was growing, and many people believed it would continue to grow, and the land area is limited, so of course we should expect the land prices continue to go up. That was the argument back then. And many people started talking about the land prices in Japan never fell before, which wasn't true. Uh, all, all we had to do was to go back like 30 years and 40 years and saw the land prices decline at some point, but the people forget and talk about how land prices never, uh, never fall. And uh, this happened in, in many other crises or many other bubbles, including the residential price bubbles in the U.S. Uh, before the glo global financial crisis. And of course, uh, expectation alone uh, is not enough to create the bubbles. There should be money that supports those expectations. And there was a, a flow of money into a property uh, market in Japan in 1980s that supported these uh, price bubble and uh, supported those uh, price bubbles backed by the expectations. 
And that is related to the, what was happening in Japan uh, on the external balance side. So the Japanese economy, um, at least by the end of 1970s, started to experience excess saving. And the initially, the J Japanese economy used those excess saving, or basically shipped those ex ex excess saving abroad uh, by running trade surplus. And uh, that um, didn't or couldn't continue uh, running into, for example, the, conf the trade conflicts with the U.S. And the Japanese government started to focus more on domestic demand. And uh, many of those excess savings started to pour into um, uh, internal, the land pr property market. And that really supported the growth of the bubbles. And I think this point is, uh, th there's an important similarity to what happened in China in 2010. So I, I will use uh, some figures to make this point uh, more in details, uh, somewhat in details a little bit later. And the next question I want to touch on is uh, how could Japan, uh, how could Japan prevent, have prevented the uh, bubbles from growing? And in theory, I think there is a way for the government or the policymakers to intervene and contain the growth of the bubble by basically restricting the flow of money that supports uh, expectation of ever increasing asset prices. So uh, monetary tightening, tightening could have worked. Uh, Macroprudential policy like uh, loan to value regulation could have worked. But I think the difficulty is uh, if you are in the middle of the bubbles, it's really hard to detect the bubble. I mean, looking back, we can say how stupid uh, many Japanese people thought that the land prices will increase forever. But if you're in the middle of the bubble, bubble it's, uh, it's really hard to detect if it's a bubble or just a sign of a continuing, it continuing to improve uh, economy. And also, it's very hard to get the timing right for those interventions. And eventually, Japan did intervene. Uh, Bank of Japan raised interest rate, uh, tightened monetary policy. And also, the Ministry of Finance restricted lending. So this is a, a kind of macroprudential policy that the Japan implement, implemented. Um, and this happened in late 1989 and 1990. And by then, probably this intervention was uh, too late. The bubble was too big. And the result was disastrous, as uh, many uh, as many of us know. Uh, Japan ended up experiencing a long time of stagnation. So uh, the short answer to the second question, or it's not not a sh not not so much a short answer, but the short answer to uh, the second question is uh, yes, it could have been prevented, but uh, probably not or difficult. So let me finish by looking at some figures, um, uh, making the point that uh, existing external imbalancing or uh, the process of uh, external rebalancing in Japan that happened in late 1980s was uh, very much related to what happened in the property market. So on the left-hand side, I show the flow of funds account and uh, uh, the capital surplus by uh, each, each sector, uh, household and the corporate and the government and the uh, uh, foreign sector. And we can see that there was uh, the deficit against the foreign sector, uh, which uh, fi financial deficit, so it's a trade surplus. And that was corrected during the 1980s. And that was the period when the Japanese economy experienced the price bubble that we are talking about today. And in fact, if you look at the flow of fund statistics for a longer period for Japan, the Japan story from 1970s to uh, today is really the how to fix, the how to uh, get rid of or uh, correct 
the excess savings in Japan that started to happen in late 1970. Uh, investment drop of Japanese economy's rapid economic growth period ended, uh, investment drops, and the imbalance emerged. And first, it was uh, balanced by large uh, budget deficit. And uh, budget deficit uh, was uh, so budget deficit uh, was reduced, and then in 1980s the trade imbalance emerged, um, and the trade conflict with the U.S. led to the correction of the external imbalance in Japan. And in the 1980s, the rebalancing um, ended up uh, causing bubble in Japan. And after the bubble's collapse. Um, the budget deficit replaced the investment. And now those budget deficits still continues in Japan. Um, and uh, household savings declined, but the corporate savings instead increased and still uh, is creating a problem of excess saving. So uh, I, I think my 15 minutes is pretty much up, but the, we can talk about what are the lessons for China and I want to point out, especially the similarity between Japan and China in terms of external rebalancing and uh, external rebalancing cause for Japan uh, was an important cause for the bubble. And uh, the many people talked about the impact of uh, external rebalancing for China in 2010. And many people argued that the bubble, the credit boom um, cannot happen or cannot lead to a crisis in China, mainly because of all of these factors that I listed here. But those factors, like uh, all of the credit is domestic, apply to Japan as well, but the Japan couldn't, um, couldn't avoid the negative effect from the credit boom. Uh, caused, caused by the external rebalancing. So the Japan provides a cautionary tale for China. And let me, let me stop here for now, and we can come back to uh, the discussion of other questions. Thank you so much, Takeo. Uh, let's... Uh, and now uh, we will turn to Paul to, to give next set of remarks. Uh, you could unmute. Yep, thank you, Ricky Richard and Ajin Lin for organizing this panel and uh, very nice to be reunited with my old colleague, Paco Hoshi and uh, also meet Professor Wei. Um, so let me make uh, sort of three sets of comments. The first set, uh, and I'm gonna focus on the sort of the aftermath of the bursting of the bubble. I'm not gonna talk so much about what caused the bursting other than to say, uh, if you have an asset price bubble, by definition, it will burst at some point. And that process started in Japan, helped by monetary policy tightening and the other tightening that Takeo referred to on the quantitative side of lending uh, around about 1990, 1991. So the bubble started to burst. Let me just make three points to frame uh, the discussion just that are more general in nature. Um, the first one is that, like it or not, uh, the risk of a banking crisis or a financial crisis is intrinsic to and inherent in the nature of a modern uh, economic and financial system. And essentially, that's because if you look on the asset side of the banking system or the financial system, you see you know, illiquid assets, factories, highways, human capital. Uh, the assets that generate wealth and prosperity are by their nature illiquid assets. But what the banking system and the financial system does more generally is to sort of turn those uh, sort of claims on those assets into more liquid claims, bank deposits, uh, treasuries, and other things that can be liquefied quite quickly. So there's an inherent mismatch, and that's actually the, the financial system, the banking system doing its job. We all benefit from that. <clears throat> but what it means is take the banking system. If for some reason depositors start to lose confidence in the banking system, they try to withdraw their cash, then very quickly uh, you can get this mismatch between the illiquid assets and the liquid uh, deposits uh, really come to a head and cause a financial or banking system collapse. You know, talk about that in the abstract, we've just seen in the last week in the United States with Silicon Valley Bank, uh, a, a, a real world example of that uh, unfold. The second sort of general comment is that 
Uh, and Takio alluded to sort of macro prudential policy, what's become very popular since the 2008-2009 uh, financial crisis is the idea of, well, let's have much stricter uh, capital requirements, let's have much uh, stricter liquidity requirements, that is, kind of require banks to hold more liquid assets, so that if there is a mishap and a run on the banking system, A, a uh, banks will have a lot more capital to absorb any losses, and therefore they should be able to, uh, confidence in the, in the deposits should be more easy to maintain. And if there is a run on the banking system, they have much more liquid assets. Now, this works to a certain extent, um, but actually it's not a fail-safe approach. Uh, when it comes to, to the capital requirements, even if banks have 15, 20% capital, um, we've seen time and time again, and we saw in the last week, uh, the ways in which big losses on the asset side of the balance sheet can overwhelm capital very, very quickly. I mean, Silicon Valley Bank, we're not here to talk about the US, uh, but it's fascinating, uh, you know, within a couple of days, the stock price went from uh, $266 to zero, and the market cap went from something like $16 billion to zero in about three or four days. So equity can disappear very quickly. What about liquidity? Well, there's a fallacy of composition effect here. What I mean by that is it's, you know, relatively easy for individual banks to try to secure more li uh, liquid assets on their balance sheets. Um, but for the system as a whole, the system as a whole has to hold the illiquid assets in the economy. And in a banking crisis, the only entity that can really create instantly uh, liquidity and solve the problem is the government-owned central bank, the so-called lender of last resort uh, function. Um, but that's often very, very unpopular, and there's various political economy reasons why that is not always effectively used. Speaking of Silicon Valley Bank, why did the Fed not uh, essentially provide that liquidity uh, to backstop the bank rather than pulling the plug? I think that's a question that is, needs to, will, will be debated, I think, in coming weeks, months, if not years. Third general pol uh, question is that how policymakers behave in the wake of the bursting of a bubble and a bank and during a banking crisis is very, very important. So in other words, policy matters. And there's kind of two extremes, if you like, and there's a menu of choices and policymakers can toggle along this spectrum. But at one end, you have what you might call forbearance. That means essentially that regulators try to work with the banking system not to put too fine a point on it, to kind of cover up the problems, um, maybe guarantee bank deposits. Japan did that again, just seen that happen in the US, um, and sort of play for time and hope to grow out of the problem. Don't recapitalize the banking system immediately. Um, that's forbearance. The other, end is, the other end is what you might call tackling the problem head on. Disclose the, the deterioration that's happened to the balance sheets, mark assets to markets, that blows up equity, but you quickly recapitalize the banking system and you restructure the assets, both the corporate assets at the, the, at the end of the bank loans and the bank balance sheets themselves. Um, that's very painful, but it can be very, very effective. So now move on to Japan with that framework in mind, what happened in Japan? Um, well, I won't go through chapter and verse, but essentially what Japan did was very much use a policy of forbearance. Um, and in, in particular, let's jump from 1990 to around about 1995. So by that stage, uh, commercial land prices in particular, uh, and particularly in the big urban areas, six urban areas, declined about 87% from the peak. So there was a massive shock to the value of the asset side of the balance sheet in Japan. And of course, if you had marked those assets to markets, if you had recognized the true extent and true nature of the damage, the true nature of the banking bank system balance sheets, um, the whole banking system would have been, would have had negative net equity. Deposits would have lost, depositors would have lost money, shareholders would have lost money. There would have been the banking crisis of all banking crises. Now, of course, when Japanese policymakers saw, if you like, the logic of that balance sheet of arithmetic looming in, the, in, 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 in their faces, uh, they moved to, uh, to prevent the banking crisis from sort of erupting. And that was 1995. And cut a long story short, in June of 1995, so five years into the asset price deflation, 
in the wake of a growing number of smaller bank failures, credit unions and, and other smaller banks, um, there started to be a run on the banking system and the Ministry of Finance, the Japanese government, came out and said, look, we have a thing called the Deposit Insurance Corporation. No depositor has ever lost a, a money in the post-war period. We're not about to start now, but what we're going to do is guarantee all deposits. Now, guaranteed deposits, that is sometimes called small lot deposits, deposits that were legally guaranteed by the government through the Japanese Deposit Insurance Corporation, represented about half of total bank deposits. It was the other half that was important. And what the government did with a stroke of a pen, a little bit of legislation, was to say, all of those deposits now are guaranteed. No need to worry about a banking system crisis, a run on the banks. What they did not do simultaneous with that, and what I think they should have done very, very quickly in tall order, was to make that guarantee more explicit by saying, but the asset side of the balance sheet has been heavily uh, eroded, equity has been blown up, we're going to need to recapitalize the banking system. And we're going to need to mobilize public money, that is government funds, to do that, at least in the short term. Japan put that off, put that off, and put that off, tried to grow out of the problem, and it didn't work. Why didn't it work? Um, I think Takeo or, or has already mentioned the sort of debt overhang. What happened was if assets disappear, but you've still got the debt uh, on your balance sheet, you go into a deleveraging cycle. And the Bank of Japan responded with monetary policy, particularly from 1995, they cut interest rates dramatically, and they kept doing that for the next 20 years. But monetary policy works through essentially wanting households and corporates to borrow money to finance economic activity. If you are trying to reduce your debt level because you have this debt overhang, monetary policy becomes impotent. So it didn't really work. The hole in the balance sheets was too big to fill through uh, this policy of growing out of the problem. There's a parallel to here, here to China, by the way. You could argue that by the 1990s, growth potential in Japan was much lower than it had been. Whereas in China, still being a kind of a developing economy, there's much more growth potential left. That's a difference, but I wouldn't want to put my money on that if I was a Chinese policymaker. So let me now come to my last set of remarks, which is, well, what are the lessons from this for Chinese policymakers? And I would identify four. The first one is, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, Chinese policymakers have to be aware of the fact, and by the way, I think they are, that banking, banking crises can always happen. Um, this time is never different. Uh, and it's always important for policymakers to be thinking ahead and anticipating almost wargaming what if scenarios. Second uh, point is, again, to echo what I said before, one way to prepare for that is with capital, higher capital adequacy, uh, higher liquidity requirements, but you cannot rely on that. You should not go to bed and sleep easy just because you think the banks are, are well capitalized and there's good liquidity at the individual bank level, because that may not be true at the system, system level. The third point to emphasize is that when we talk about banking crises and financial crises, the, the, the biggest danger is when you have a big bank credit driven asset price bubble, because what that involves is the balance sheet of the banking system sort of being artificially expanded by the bubble, creating both uh, loans on the asset side and deposits on the liability side. When the bubble bursts, as it will, if it is a bubble, the assets dr dramatically drop in value, but the deposits are still there. And um, unless they're marked to market, um, there's this huge mismatch. And that will lead to policy uh, depositors starting to figure out, aha, the assets that are supposed to be backing my safe deposits are not safe anymore. My deposits are not safe. And that's what leads to the banking uh, crisis and the run. So there are different kinds of crises, bank credit driven real estate bubbles. By the way, in Japan, it was not just a real estate bubble. It was also an equity bubble, and the banks were very exposed to equity markets as well. So that compounded the issue. Beware of those. And my fourth comment um, and, and lesson for Chinese policymakers is 
if China does find itself in this situation, it will be very, how do you avoid the Japan problem? Well, you avoid Japanese policy approaches, and that is you avoid forbearance. A little bit of forbearance may work if the problem is small, or if it looks like the problem, say the asset price correction is reversible, but clearly in Japan's case, it wasn't. And policymakers have to be prepared to bite the bullet, mark assets to market, enforce good disclosure on the banks, recognize when banks are heavily undercapitalized, if not insolvent, and be prepared in those circumstances, which of course, if you do nothing else, you'll cause a huge run on the banking system to quickly recapitalize the banking system. That's more or less what the US did in 2008 and 2009, worked pretty well. Japan did not do that. Um, I think China has two clear uh, templates to choose from. And I think it's very important that when they find themselves, if and when they find themselves in a Japan kind of situation, um, that they use all of the policy tools at their disposal in a coordinated way to have a coherent macro and, and financial system uh, approach, which will require getting rid of that excess debt, recapitalizing the banking system, and avoiding what are sometimes called, and Takeo, I think, invented this term with a colleague, zombie firms or zombification of the economy. Let me leave it at there. Thank you, Paul, for the insights. Now let's turn to Professor Xiong. Oh, hi. Uh, okay, it's my turn. Uh, first, uh, I'm very uh, delighted to join this panel uh, to discuss uh, uh, the lessons from Japanese uh, uh, risk bubble for China. Uh, this seems to be a week, uh, a, a month actually full of uh, discussions about uh, China's real estate. So this is a clearly uh, becoming a, a global problem. Uh, many people around the world are worried about what might happen uh, with the Chinese real estate. Um, uh, this is actually the second panel I'm joining. In. <laughs> there was another one uh, at the Stanford uh, two, two weeks ago. Um, uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to follow uh, Takio and Paul's uh, insightful discussions uh, early on. In fact, actually, uh, as someone who worked uh, quite uh, extensively on bubbles, I, I, I spent many uh, years early on to study bubbles. I think the Japanese uh, real estate bubble has always been a fascinating subject. Uh, is it a bubble and uh, you know how, how could it be avoided? This has always been an issue. Uh, very glad to see uh, Takeo's uh, 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 discussion. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. And uh, and I, I do uh, uh, agree that uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, um, uh, lessons we could learn from Japan. In fact, actually, uh, China followed the Japan's footstep in many ways early on in developing the Chinese economy. And, uh, and indeed, uh, uh, the real estate problem look, in many ways looks just like uh, what happened to Japan back in the 90s, right? Because uh, after uh, some decades of uh, high growth, uh, uh, our real estate prices uh, are, uh, are now become very, very high, right? Much higher than uh, um, uh, people's uh, household uh, income. Um, and of course, expectations are, uh, played a very big uh, role here. Uh, after 10% uh, annual growth uh, in income and also uh, in economy uh, for, for uh, 20, 30 years, right? <laughs> Anyone will form sort of a, a very high expectation about uh, prices that uh, keep going up uh, uh, going forward, right? So, so I think uh, uh, these are very uh, uh, similar. Um, and, uh, but uh, I, I would actually add a bit to what uh, Takio mentioned. I, I want to actually, before I draw the, the uh, uh, similarity, I want to actually highlight a bit of a difference. Uh, the Chinese economy actually, uh, after 40 years of uh, uh, reforms, many people agree has been uh, highly successful, but, uh, but actually it's, uh, it's not quite the same as a typical uh, 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 Western economy like uh, uh, US and Japan. Uh, let me share uh, just, I have this one, what, I, can you see my chart here on the screen? I have this one chart. Can, can you see it? Yeah, okay, this is a chart. So this is a chart about the China's real estate sector, the structure. Uh, I, I, I meant to use this chart to say that um, 
Um, Chinese econ uh, China's real estate sector is very much like Chinese uh, economy. It's a hybrid structure. It's not 100% the market economy. In fact, uh, actually, uh, uh, the government is heavily involved in every corner of the Chinese economy, right? Real estate uh, sector is the same, right? So uh, here, uh, uh, in the real estate sector, uh, governments are heavily involved, especially local governments. In fact, actually, local governments are probably the most important player in China's real estate because the local governments' uh, a key source of fiscal revenue actually is land sales, right? Because by constitution, land belongs to the state. And the local governments actually control the use right of the land and can sell uh, this use right regularly to the market. That's how actually eventually sort of the, the, the whole real estate the market builds on, right? The land, the most important input, right? So, uh, and uh, in recent years, uh, land sales contribute to about 40% of the local government uh, physical budget, right? So that's how big it is. So in that sense, so the why there's a bubble and the why uh, 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 home buyers are so optimistic about real estate, actually a uh, key reason actually is because recognizing uh, government is behind because uh, government cannot afford to let the real estate go, right? So for that reason, uh, despite the prices being high, Typically, people think real estate is still safe because uh, uh, if real estate crash, that means there's uh, basically a, a big crash to uh, uh, local government's budget, right? And uh, and also banks are uh, happy to lend uh, 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 based on real estate collateral, uh, not only to government, but also to real estate market and to household. Uh, all with the understanding that uh, uh, because the government is behind, so, so real estate is safe, despite so the, all this talk about uh, 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 is too bubbly. <laughs> so uh, with this sort of structure in mind, I think sort of uh, uh, it, it's uh, 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 easy to understand the sort of uh, uh, the dynamics uh, about the China's real estate uh, is going to be somewhat different. So so even though so the many would argue that. Uh, um, uh, the prices are high, a lot of debt involved. And interestingly, uh, most of the debt actually, especially the increase in debt actually is because of local government. Because local government use themselves uh, to build the infrastructure, to do the city development and to do economic stimulus in 2008 and all of that, all based on land sale. When, when land sales cannot cover actually the borrowed uh, heavily uh, uh, using uh, future land sales as collateral, using uh, land as collateral. So basically, uh, uh, a lot of this is because of uh, uh, local government. So, so, so with this sort of a big background in mind, sort of, uh, uh, I, 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 I've been sort of uh, having this view that uh, it's unlikely actually China going to have a uh, say banking crisis or a debt crisis or, 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 or actually the kind of. Uh, uh, Japan style of sort of real estate crash, where the price just uh, sort of uh, uh, drop uh, uh, off the cliff uh, in short period of time, uh, in a few years, kind of a short period of time in real estate uh, sort of horizon, right? So the reason for that is because the government will use administrative uh, 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 measures actually to prevent such kind of hard lending in real estate uh, for all sorts of reasons. So, and in fact, actually during the COVID, especially last year, 2020, which was particularly hard in China, as many of you know, uh, and the third tier cities in China actually experienced a, a very hard time uh, in real estate. A local government cannot sell much land and uh, uh, a lot of pressure inventory uh, building up. Uh, uh, and just uh, uh, in this kind of situation, 20 plus cities actually uh, issue the ban on uh, real estate price drop uh, beyond a certain uh, limit. So, 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 which is a very uh, uh, direct measure right, taken to prevent the uh, uh, prices be, uh, 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 from falling uh, off a cliff, right? And because of the, 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 the consequence is obvious, uh, when real estate price uh, goes down, then banks have to mark down. Uh, or uh, the loan portfolios, right, written uh, based on, on, on real estate. And also, uh, uh, a, re a local government will really have a hard time to sell land. And then uh, price will have to fall and, uh, you know, everything go together. So, so, so this is exactly sort of the, the challenge. That's why sort of uh, 
uh, the government actually had been very <laughs> decisive in many ways, actually, uh, to confront the problem uh, by using these unconventional uh, measures uh, uh, viewed from a uh, Western point of view. But uh, actually, this is quite common, actually, in China because of its hybrid economic structure, because the government is always there and heavily involved. So, so I think sort of with this bear in mind, actually, uh, I want to actually now uh, 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 maybe quickly mention uh, lessons from Japan. Uh, I think uh, uh, Takio and Paul both mentioned about uh, uh, potential uh, zombie firms that overhand. So even though uh, I think because the government gonna have, uh, uh, will, will actively engage in intervention to prevent the hard landing, but nevertheless, the problem doesn't go away. The problem is there. It's just gonna be kind of uh, uh, steered in a way from being exploded, but, uh, but the problem is still there. So I think this is where actually I think uh, China uh, could learn a lot from uh, Japanese experience in the aftermath, how to you know, minimize the economic cost. Um, because uh, ultimately the real estate, we all agree there's a, a big problem uh, in Chinese real estate. So the ultimate cost of this real estate problem is gonna be on economic growth, right? So because uh, and the, the, the problem actually is even harder on China because uh, uh, Chinese economy actually uh, relied heavily on uh, government to stimulate the economy. That's what happened in 2008, right? So, uh, and actually happened uh, many times before, whenever there's a downturn, uh, government is uh, heavily involved in using all sorts of measures to stimulate the economy. And often the stimulus are uh, implemented by local governments. But now, actually, local government's fiscal budget is tied up with real estate, right? So that means actually, uh, local government cannot uh, really do much. Or they're, they're basically their hands are tied at this point, uh, by real estate. So, so that means uh, uh, the zombie firm problem, the debt hold hand problem, Japan uh, 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 had to experience as Tokyo. Uh, 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 very nicely highlighted uh, uh, in his uh, uh, work before, actually may play out uh, in a different form, actually, in China. Uh, we're going to have a zombie local government. So this will be actually sort of a, a challenge China has to confront, right? So, so, so to follow up on Powell's earlier discussion, uh, I actually want to sort of uh, 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 I put the problem a little bit different because Powell very forcefully mentioned that uh, China should uh, uh, openly uh, uh, confront the problem, should buy the bullet, uh, publicize the problem, right? Just address it head on, right? So that means actually uh, let the that uh, issue play out, and that may means uh, there's gonna be a lot of uh, uh, failures, maybe uh, real estate companies like Evergrande, maybe some banks and maybe uh, even local government, right? So, so I, I actually, uh, whether this is the right uh, course of action to take or not, uh, we can argue, but I'm pretty sure this is not the path China gonna follow. China actually gonna do exactly the opposite. Uh, as I mentioned, that 20 plus cities already issued a ban on uh, 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 price drop, right? So, so that's actually exactly the measure taken to prevent uh, the problem being disrupted uh, uh, from disrupting the, the 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 debt problem, the real estate problem, or local government's problem, actually so far, and actually which has been the 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 you know what we observe how uh, Chinese government confronted this kind of problem, right? Is actually trying to uh, steer the problem away. So the mentality there is that uh, uh, you know as long as uh, uh, growth is there, right, all this problem will go away by itself. So, so, so the mentality there is really try to get growth back. And, uh, and uh, in the meantime, uh, do not let the problem disrupt uh, the economy and, uh, and keep going. So, so this is the mentality. So, so of course, uh, this is where I guess we can <laughs> discuss, is this the right way to do it or, or, or not? Uh, perhaps uh, I should stop here. We, 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 can, we, can, we, can, we can discuss more later. <laughs> Thank you so much, Wei, and thank you for uh, the excellent remarks of all three of our panelists. We'll now move into a moderated question and answer session. Uh, while members of the audience are 
uh, compiling and typing questions into the Zoom uh, Q&A feature, Jinlin and I will begin with several pre-submitted and pre-prepared questions. Uh, to start off, as Paul mentioned, debates over bailouts for Silicon Valley Bank remind us of the intense politics uh, and competing interests around bank and financial system bailouts. Are there similarities or, or what are the similarities between um, the political economies of uh, real estate bubbles and responses to the real estate bubbles in Japan and China? Uh, for instance, can China's policymakers today learn from how Japanese authorities responded to the demands of influential firms or competing sectors that depended on property markets? And perhaps what was the role of banks, developers, or um, other influential players in Japan's economy in shaping Japan's policy responses to the bubble. Paul, if you could begin, and then Wei, maybe you can you can add remarks. Great, thank you very much, uh, Richard. Um, yeah, let me let me just again maybe just answer this question by just fleshing out a little bit more sort of the, the the key policy error as I saw it in Japan. And I have to say, having just listened to Professor Jiang's uh, analysis, um, I'm I'm getting more worried about China that China might repeat that same uh, that same mistake um, because you know if 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 you have all these things happening, asset prices fall. The, you know that's the economy. You know, really trying to equilibrate. Um, value assets, and that's the best way of moving forward, of getting assets maybe transferred from, you know, a management team that has failed uh, to one which can use those assets more productively. So that's my basic point, that, that you know, China may well have a different way, because China's different, you know, in various ways that have been touched upon, a different way of kind of tackling the problem head on. But I think the real important point is, you cannot, as a policymaker, or you should not, just try to put a lid on things and you know hope to grow out of the problem. Rather, you have to find ways of, of kind of uh, resolving the underlying issues. Now, some of those issues might be um, sort of institutional and structural. And I'm struck again, listening to Professor Young, reminding me that of this point about local governments require uh, being very reliant on um, land price, uh, land sales to generate revenue. That sounds like to me, and I think it would to many economists, of basically being a real problem with the fiscal framework. So forget about banking crises for a moment. I think Chinese policymakers really need to, you know, untangle that mess and create a different kind of fiscal framework because governments can create money. They don't need to get their hands on money by selling land. That seems to me a very bad template. But on the political economy question, the big problem in, in, in uh, Japan, uh, Richard and Jin Lin, was that the policymakers were very happy to guarantee all the deposits in the banking system. What that meant was they now were the contingent owners of those liabilities and essentially the shadow owners of the depreciated assets in the banking system. But having done that, having put one foot forward on that front, they were extremely reluctant to do the consistent thing and put the other foot forward by injecting a huge amount of capital into the banking system. Um, this issue was discussed in Japan. So this is the political economy issue. And you know what? Japanese policymakers and commentators at the time would say would say, well, that's too unpopular to, to mobilize public money to bail out the banking system. Um, but somehow guaranteeing bank deposits and becoming the contingent owner of the banking system somehow wasn't unpopular. It kind of didn't make sense. And very early on, back in, I think it was 92, um, the prime minister famously at the time, uh, Miyazawa, Miyazawa Gichi um, went to the banks and said, he was a prime minister, he'd been the minister of finance and said, look, he could see the numbers. Um, and he said, we need to recapitalize the banks. And the bank said, no, thanks, we don't need the money. That was 92. Well, the government didn't get around to really putting in place a bank recapitalization framework until 1999, a little bit in 1998. There was another incident back in 1995, 96, when this housing loan financing corporations called Jusen um, were bailed out and money was put into them. And that was basically the beginning of the end of it. So um, 
it's it's look asset price bubbles that burst and caused a banking system crisis are not pleasant things and it's really important that politicians and governments have uh the the political will and the capacity to do what in the short term might be a politically unpalatable thing which is again bailing out the banking system it's not really bailing out the banking system it's trying to get the, the the economy and the banking system back in a situation where it can actually play its role in facilitating future growth um trying to grow out of the problem when the problem is too big is is actually ultimately going to become counterproductive thank you way would you like to add to that sure okay i, I will i will uh Add a bit to what uh, uh, Paul uh, uh, mentioned about uh, uh, policy response. Uh, I agree with uh, uh, many things that Paul mentioned. Indeed, uh, from uh, a conventional view, uh, especially from uh, somebody uh, like myself, I actually spent 20 plus years study uh, a US economy, the policy actions here. Uh, following um, a market-based approach in intervention right? our government policy. Um, so the situation, uh, the, the, the actions taken by policymakers in China often uh, look a bit different. <laughs> so, but I have to say that actually, because of its hybrid economy, so uh, the policy space actually is bigger uh, there than say in the US or, or maybe uh, uh, as, uh, in, in Japan as well. Uh, because in both the US and Japan, I believe policymakers actually often are constrained, right? Because the uh, Fed clearly need the Congress uh, uh, authorization before it can do uh, very things, right? But uh, but uh, uh, in China, uh, the the government actually can take a lot of actions uh, on its own, and uh, and uh, it also. Uh, can mobilize state banks and the state firms. Uh, and uh, in what we observed uh, last year in resolving the Evergrande situation, uh, basically local government gathered uh, uh, banks and uh, state real estate firm, basically uh, they restructured, uh, of, of course Evergrande as well, they uh, restructured uh, uh, a lot of uh, the uh, uh, debt obligations internally, right? And of course, Evergrande uh, uh, also uh, privately sold some of its assets to state uh, real estate firms. So, so that's sort of these kind of uh, 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 solutions uh, are probably not on the menu of the Fed or, or, or Bank of Japan. I think so. So, so, so that's why sort of the uh, situation there. Um, will be addressed in a different way. So uh, of course, uh, a lot of creativity is required. Uh, I'm not sure, so we have seen exactly <laughs> uh, what uh, the policymaker in China uh, are gonna address this issue. And um, uh, we know, I, I, it's fair to say that with this hybrid structure, uh, policymakers actually play a much bigger role uh, and uh, and uh, of course, at this point, uh, policy risk is probably the biggest risk actually in China, much bigger than in the US or, or in Japan. So 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 uh, even though uh, uh, because of the hybrid structure, uh, policymaker can make things happen, uh, resolve a lot of things. For example, preventing a debt crisis from disrupting, and also preventing a hard landing in the real estate sector. But at the same time, actually, wrong policy action uh, can actually make things a lot worse. Uh, uh, as uh, Takio mentioned earlier, right? So what uh, Japan did uh, in dealing with the Japanese bubble, uh, right? So that the policy action actually made it worse, clearly, right? So just sort of uh, uh, tightening up uh, uh, the monetary policy and the restricting lending uh, at the wrong time actually made it worse, rather than make it uh, easier. So I think the same kind of situation, I think uh, uh, I also worry. So, so because uh, uh, China actually situation is more complex because of this uh, 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 intricate uh, uh, connections uh, with all these uh, uh, players, especially uh, different levels of government that are deeply uh, involved in the market, right? 
So, so then how to resolve the situation? Clearly, there will be a lot of moral hazards uh, involved, right? So, so uh, uh, that overhang problem uh, will be there. So in this kind of very complicated situation, and also uh, with the uh, political, uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, complicated political considerations will be at play as well. So, so that actually will uh, dramatically complicate uh, the situation rather than making it easier. Yeah, uh, that's all uh, I, I want to say for now. Thank you. Can, can, can I uh, add something here sure. Sure. related? Um, uh, it's, um, it, it's, it, I, I think it's nice to hear Japan is considered to be a typical Western economy or oh, not much different <laughs> from the U.S. economy. That, that's what I uh, try to convince people for the last 30 years or so. And at least in 1990s, uh, Japan was not considered to be a typical Western mm -hmm. economy. And uh, many people pointed out the difference. And the mm -hmm. government is more involved uh, in Japan. Yeah. And, and I guess an important thing uh, in the context of our discussion is the uh, Japanese policymaker, the Ministry of Finance especially, believed uh, Japan is different from the U.S. and they have more power, they have more policy space than mm -hmm. the U.S. policymakers so that mm -hmm. they can handle the fallout from the collapse of the bubble much better than the U.S. can do. You know, I remember uh, doing a conference on financial crisis back in on U.S. financial crisis, like Isandel financial crisis in 1993 or 1994. And uh, uh, late Ed Kane was one of the authors. And he talked about the, all the problems, all the uh, mismanagement of the uh, Isandel crisis by the policymakers and so on. And the reaction of the Japanese audience, especially the policymakers, are, you know, this happened in the U.S., but cannot happen in Japan. You know, Japan, the Ministry of Finance is in control. And they try to do a little bit more than forbearance, uh, right? The, although it comes down much closer to forbearance and, but the, than the decisive move. But I think the Ministry of Finance believed that they can maneuver the situation okay without going all out to address the questions. So juice and rescue, uh, they assume the la land prices will come back a little bit. And uh, that's something in uh, $6 billion is enough to correct the situation. And they went ahead with the restructuring of Jusen. So I, I think uh, one problem of Japan was uh, too much confidence of the policymakers mm -hmm. and too much belief in the policy space, which... Uh, looking back that they didn't really have. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's something that Chinese uh, policymakers need to worry about too. No, I agree, actually. I think that as I said, this actually is the biggest worry. There's indeed a lot of complacency in the Chinese make, <laughs> makers, right? So, uh, you know, after the economy growing uh, at the speed that uh, 10% for, for the years, right? There's a lot of confidence. Uh, maybe overconfidence. So, so that is a, <laughs> indeed a big worry. Yeah, I get another question from. Uh, it's also a policy question, and uh, quite frequently discussed in China as well recently. So, what's the effect of the Plaza Accord on Japan's property bubble, or on authorities' ability to handle the property bubble? This is a question for our China, uh, Japan experts. Maybe Professor Shion can discuss people's understanding and misunderstanding in China regarding this. Okay, let, let, me, let me take take on this question on Plaza Accord because I, I hear uh, this argument a lot. And I think there's a misunderstanding of uh, what we should learn from the Plaza Accord. So just recap what Jin Lin pointed out. The, Many people argue or the popular account of uh, Japan's trouble is a plaza agreement uh, which led to a yen appreciation against the U.S. dollar, um, led to the loss of competitiveness 
of the Japanese industries, especially export industries, and that led to the stagnation of the Japanese economy. And I, I think that's the simplest argument. And uh, and here uh, there, there are several problems uh, because uh, Plaza Accord was followed by a Ruble Accord that many people thought um, the yen appreciation or the stabilization of the dollar or depreciation of the dollar went too far and uh, try to reverse the course and support the dollars a little bit uh, in, in Ruble Accord. And uh, that argued um, um, may, many other um, in many other countries to uh, increase the demand or loosen the monetary policy. And uh, that, in a sense, led to the bubble in the Japanese economy. And, and even without Ruble Accord, I think the BOJ would have intervened by loosening the monetary policy in 1986 or so because they suffered from the yen appreciation recession or endaka recession that followed the Plaza Accord. So instead of the Plaza Accord and the yen depreciation created the stagnation of the Japanese economy, what ha rather happened was that there was a resistance for the yen appreciation and the BOJ intervened by loosening the monetary policy and that, of course, as I said, this fundamental story of the bubble doesn't quite work, but that uh, accommodated the creation or, or the growth of the bubbles. So I, I think the problem was not so much the Plaza Accord and the Yen appreciation, but the Japanese voice policymakers' response to resist to Yen appreciation. Can I just... Can I just add one one note to that? Um, which hasn't really come up. The other thing that was happening uh, in the 1980s, beginning of the, the early 1980s, kind of played into the Plaza Accord to a certain extent, was pressure on Japan. Well, first of all, maturation of the, of the economy. The Japan, Japan had sort of transitioned during the 1970s from a high growth economy to a lower growth economy. And the banking system you know, had played a very critical role in the post-war period through the so-called main bank system of being the sort of the principal kind of source of financing, if you like, um, you know, to the corporate sector. As you went into the 19, 1980s, two things happened. One is that a lot of corporations, you know, Toyota was a famous one, um, didn't need to borrow from banks anymore. They were generating a lot of internal cash flow and became essentially sort of debt free. And so the banks started to look around for other places to initiate credit creation. And the second thing that was happening was you had this deregulation of the financial system started, uh, the yen dollar committee and, and other initiatives where policymakers from outside the US in particular, putting pressure on Japanese policymakers to open up the financial system. And so uh, that sort of, the, the, problem, no, the problem with that was that there was kind of a, a lack of kind of maturity, um, lessons had not been learned. Um, and yeah, I think that kind of uh, set of factors also played into sort of why the bubble happened when it did. Um, you just can't say, well, the Bank of Japan cut interest rates. They did that, you know, in the 1990s and the 2000s. That didn't cause a bubble. So, you know, a number of factors were coming together. But I think that sort of maturation of the economy and financial, the beginning, the first steps towards financial deregulation, taking the shackles off different financial actors all played into the mix as well. And again, lessons for China there would be, you know, China, again, is continuously, you know, going through institutional reform and its place in the global economy, internationalization of the RMB um, and, and, and all the things that go with that are also changing the nature of the Chinese economy. So I would underscore Takeo's point that policymakers need to wake up every day and shake off any hubris that they might uh, wake up with. Uh, okay, so let me uh, say a bit, uh, follow up a bit. Um, I think uh, indeed actually Plaza Accord uh, has been widely discussed in China, often viewed as sort of Western uh, conspiracy, right? So I think it's to the extent that uh, 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 there has been uh, 
several years of trade war, open trade war with the U.S., right? So, so I think sort of there's no need to discuss a conspiracy theory anymore. So I think this issue has already been uh, played out in full in many ways, I think. So, but so far, it seems that, um, uh, you know, uh, even though export industry has been a key driver of the Chinese growth uh, uh, for, for, for two decades, I think its role is actually... Uh, Gradually uh, 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 phasing out, uh, phasing out. So, so this is uh, uh, and this contribution to growth is more and more limited. So, so I think sort of, uh, and also with the sort of uh, all the uh, uh, recent uh, uh, a lot of more confrontation, uh, sort of uh, uh, with uh, uh, dip uh, in the diplomacy domain. So, that I think sort of. Uh, uh, my understanding is that uh, policymakers in China actually uh, are actually working very hard to steer the economy into internal uh, consumption driven rather than export driven. So, so for that, I think sort of uh, all this uh, concern will be actually uh, less relevant uh, in the coming years. But uh, uh, yeah, so so and and clearly, actually, for the real estate sector, I think this is a, a even less of a concern because uh, uh, the real estate the sector, I think, is really uh, heavily uh, domestic driven, and as I mentioned, especially it's a uh, uh, local government driven. So so I think uh, there the 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 underlying factors are very different uh, from actually all these external factors. Yeah. We have um, a question a little related to the comments on uh, yen appreciation and the Plaza Accords uh, on uh, monetary policy. Japan in the 1980s and 90s and China in the 20 teens both had extraordinary rates of credit creation and expansions of money supply. Why did these developments not lead to higher inflation or larger financial crises in either country? And perhaps should we consider Japan's policies successful in the sense that they did not lead to high inflation or a larger scale financial crises in either the 1990s or 2000s? Paul, maybe you can begin answering this and then Takeo as well. Um, right, so the... I think if you go, you know, again, you have you have to kind of look at this in, in the sort of the sequence. Monetary policy uh, you know, behaved very differently in the 1980s and uh, maybe up until the mid 1990s, and then in the subsequent period, um, you know, when initially the Bank of Japan was sort of you know fighting the stronger yen, dealing with the Plaza Accord, as has been discussed, trying to stoke domestic demand. Remember that another thing that was going on in the 1980s, apropos of uh, what Professor Xiong just said about domestic demand in, in uh, China was that you had this whole sort of policy thrust in the 1980s to stoke domestic demand and not be reliant on export demand, the so-called so famous Maikawa report. And Maikawa uh, was a former Bank of Japan governor. So there's this focus on using monetary policy to stoke domestic demand. Now, that didn't spill over into inflation, that spilled over into uh, domestic asset price inflation. So this is perennial debate yeah, which continues today about, you know, what are the effects of monetary policy? Um, you may mobilize monetary policy to try to stabilize the price level or the inflation rate, let's call it, say, 2%, not be very successful. And this is really the story of post-1995 in Japan, where monetary policy was put on full, um, sort of, you know, fully-fledged quantitative easing, zero interest rate policy, QQE, you name it. Everything was thrown at the economy that didn't cause inflation. It didn't actually cause asset price inflation. And again, I think the context, the circumstances are always very important because by the time the Bank of Japan put its foot on the monetary gas from 1995 onwards, you were in this deflationary de uh, deleveraging, secular deleveraging uh, in Japan. The, the, the initial debt had built up, that debt had to be sort of worked off and deleveraged. And so the economy didn't re didn't really respond either through inflation, price and goods inflation, or uh, asset price inflation to that very very loose monetary policy. Again, just to draw one policy implication out here, um, I think it's really important whether it's China, Japan, the U.S., wherever 
not in these kind of circumstances for policymakers and for the general sort of commentariat to become too focused on any one policy tool. What is often required is, I think, to step back and look at the total situation and say, what is the overall policy mix that is required here? What do we need to do with monetary policy, fiscal policy, banking system policy, and maybe structural reform policy to put the economy in a good place you know, for the future? And that requires policy coordination. And often uh, government structures are not set up in such a way that policy coordination comes naturally. Um, and if thinking of the China case, for example, there seems to be a bit of a conflict between the policy goals of the local governments and the policy goals and preferences of the central government. So that might be one area to think about a little bit more in the Chinese context, not just across policy tools, but how do you get everybody on the same page, in the same boat, to pull the policy levers in a consistent way, not just across the different levels of government. That was not such a big issue in, in, in Japan. It seems to be a much bigger challenge in, in China. I, I think, uh, I, I just want to echo what uh, Paul said at, at the end, the policy mix or uh, talking about or looking at all the policy tools and coordinate those policies are really important in tackling the big uh, macroeconomic issues. And on the lack of inflation, I think uh, by looking at the inflation stayed low, even in late 1980s, uh, the Japanese case, uh, we can say the Japanese case wasn't bad. Um, and uh, one thing which is related thing I want to emphasize here is the we talk about the Japanese case as a failure. And I, I, I think there, there was a failure uh, of the policy making in 1990s and 2000. But uh, the, the result wasn't really a disaster. The Japan con the growth rate for Japan declined and stopped growing, but Japan is a very comfortable place to live in. And I, I've been in Japan for three years now, and I've been uh, satisfied with the quality of life here. So I, I guess it's better, it, it's a good thing if uh, China can avoid the problems for uh, that, that Japan experienced in the last 30 years or so. But even if China cannot, and uh, if the China experiences something like uh, Japanese stagnation, it wouldn't be a disaster. So that, <laughs> that I want to emphasize. Okay, uh, maybe uh, should I add a few words about the lack of inflation? I think uh, uh, my understanding, uh, I, I think as the, uh, uh, this is a very good question. Indeed, uh, a lot of uh, credit growth uh, in China over the years um, why there's no inflation, right? Uh, there are two points coming to my mind. Uh, one is common, uh, similar to Japan, because the savings rate has been very high. So this is a blessing uh, to both uh, Chinese economy and the Japanese economy uh, early on, right? So, so during the process, uh, uh, despite the income growth and despite uh, a lot of credit floating around, uh, household actually, uh, maintained a very high savings rate. And instead of spending uh, their income, uh, you know, uh, uh, on uh, consumption, right? So, uh, you know, in US we know actually household actually, they borrow even more to spend. So, so, so in China actually household they save a lot and they use the saving actually to buy houses, right? And often actually multiple units. So, so basically the inflation in China is basically in the housing price, right? So that's where the, 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 the China's inflation is. And of course, the, the usually used in inflation index actually had a very little uh, component uh, 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 given to housing prices, right? Rent is there, but, uh, but uh, not the housing prices directly, right? So that's, that's a key reason. And of course, uh, uh, about the credit itself, uh, I mentioned a little bit earlier, actually most of the credit growth actually went to local governments and the state firms. So which uh, used the credit actually to build the infrastructure and uh, take on a lot of uh, investment. So that has been the driver for the, uh, in many ways, right? So, so especially in the last two decades, the, the, the 
the the the, the growth. Uh, a, a big part is uh, all these large scale infrastructure projects. That's where the the, the credit went basically. Thank you. In the interest of time, Richard and I will pick the last two questions from the Q&A board. Um, so one question is about Japan and China share the trend in the demographic change, but China has no substantial retirement savings nor pension system, yet is mm -hmm. aging rather rapidly. Do you have the concern that the China's correction in the real estate market will be an order of a magnitude greater than, China, than Japan's last decades. Any of you want to ask this question, answer this question? Perhaps I'll just, just well, again, <laughs> just say ahead. one, uh, give uh, Wei a, a chance to gather his thoughts, because I think we want to hear from him most. Um, but just again, I would emphasize that, you know, China has, I mean, you know, Japan used to be called the miracle economy, and now, of course, China has been the miracle economy. Its its economic development process has been, you know, longer lasting and more dramatic and and more impressive. Um, but I think it's it's really important along that path for for Chinese policymakers to kind of reflect on the institutional framework that they have, and you know, and and say, for example, apropos of this question what sort of retirement schemes do we need to, to put in place and, and and take the opportunity to do that? I mean, I think this is a point that's been made for well, a number of years now by Western economists that uh, China should use the opportunity that's had in the last few years of this rapid growth and much more, you know, higher standard of living to start to put in place the institutional framework, which is more forward looking. Japan did this in the 1960s. I think it was the 1960s when Japan put in place its national health, national pension schemes. Um, you know, different governments have always got to be looking at those frameworks and saying, okay, perhaps we didn't need them in the past, but now we're moving into a phase where we do need them. And the demography issue, you know, is a, a very important one because, you know, again, this has been talked about a lot, but demographic headwinds yeah, are going to be quite strong in China in terms of the potential growth rate. And you need something to offset that. And that's really only investment or um, technological pro progress and productivity. Uh, investment tends to correlate with population. If you have a declining population and workforce, you're probably going to have also uh, not such a tailwind on investment. So it really leaves technological innovation productivity as the key element. Um, and so again, if the premise in China is well, because of Chinese characteristics, they can rely a little bit more on growth than um, Japan did. That growth has to come from productivity. And if you're gumming up the system with forbearance and putting a floor under real estate prices and sort of the government is artificially, I don't want to sound too much like a market fundamentalist, but you know, <laughs> interfering in various and increasing ways in the economy, that may end up coming at the expense of productivity growth. Um, and there are no, there's no other source of growth for China. Can I can I add one, one thing to that? Uh, as Paul mentioned, uh, Japan expanded the social security system or the national pension system in 1970s. And uh, one looking back, uh, one mistake or, or what what turned out to be a mistake is uh, Japan created those uh, social uh, social security system ba basically. Uh, uh, pay-as-you-go system based on the ha uh, high economic growth rate, or sorry, population growth rate. So assuming the reasonable population growth rate to continue, the social security system was created, and now the Japanese birth rate has declined, and the population is uh, declining too. So that creates the existing social security system, which is based on uh, population projection, which turned out to be wrong is in a crisis. There, there have been some reform in social security system, but uh, that's, uh, so, so China in a sense has an advantage that uh, China can create a social security system, uh, maybe more funded than the pay as you go, which may be robust to the decline in uh, population in the near future. 
Okay, let me uh, add a few words on this. Uh, this is indeed a very big problem for, for Chinese economy. Um, for the first time uh, in 2022 last year, uh, the birth rate in China dropped below the death rate, right? So, so this is for the first time. That means the population is shrinking uh, for the first time. And uh, I think actually, uh, you know, just a lot, just only a few years ago, right? Uh, the government abandoned the one one child policy only just a few years uh, before that. Right? So I think this is area actually, uh, the government should have confronted the issue much earlier on because it's totally predicted, right? So the birth rate uh, is totally predicted. But, but nevertheless, so, so this is going to be a, a very big issue, uh, perhaps even bigger issue than the real estate itself, right? Because of course, uh, the shrinking population is going to put a lot of pressure on the real estate market. Maybe not this year or next year, but eventually, right? So, so I think uh, I think this is a big bomb coming. Uh, I agree that uh, uh, with Paul that uh, uh, ultimately technology is the way out, right? Ultimately, because with a shrinking population, how can you grow the economy? So it has coming from productivity. And the, in fact, actually last week was uh, uh, China's People's Congress. Uh, 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 and uh, as far as I can tell, actually, uh, a lot of discussion, right? And uh, in terms of policy, it seems like a huge focus on technology, basically. <laughs> so, 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 so the government uh, 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 policymakers uh, uh, also recognize that. That's why there's so much uh, about how to uh, uh, to to quickly grow uh, China's uh, uh, technology, uh, but. Uh, but have said that, that, we know technology will take a long time to come, right? So, and, uh, and there's no guarantee about it. So in that sense, I actually want to uh, echo what uh, Ta Ta uh, Takio mentioned earlier about the low growth, right? So ultimately, I think uh, uh, we have to be realistic. The 10% per year growth is, uh, is, on, <laughs> is, on, is, is, is not going to be there going forward. Six uh, percent. This year's target is five percent, right? Growth rate uh, in China. China still have uh, the the planning, so which sets uh, uh, annual growth rate, uh, right? So the the target, the government's target for this year is five uh, percent. Um, five percent actually is also quite challenging, I have to say, because uh, given the uh, difficulty I mentioned earlier, right? So the three growth engines are all gone in some sense. Uh, uh, export industry. Uh, cannot keep up, right? And the real estate uh, was uh, also one of the key uh, engines for the Chinese economy. So this engine, it, even if it doesn't fail, it's uh, going to be substantially uh, impaired. So, so, so then, uh, infrastructure uh, development was the other engine, but it has to be funded by local government, largely funded by local government, uh, which had to rely on uh, land sales. So, so, so in that sense, sort of uh, all three engines are in uh, a bit of a problem, right? So, so that's why I think so sort of going forward, I think actually uh, everyone has to kind of uh, uh, gradually get used to the notion that growth rate can be, you know, 6% or 5%. I think eventually it has to come down, come down right? And uh, and uh, and uh, will people be happy? I think <laughs> Ta Takio mentioned that the people in Japan, uh, uh, you know, managed to survive right? <laughs> the low growth environment. I think sort of China still has to uh, uh, find a way to accept that. I think it would be particularly difficult for China because of all the political reasons. I think uh, the government actually still plays a very dominant role, right? It sets the planning, uh, five year plans, and also annual plan and all these. So in fact, actually, I think actually, in my mind, actually, uh, a big worry is that if the government sets too ambitious of plan, that actually sometimes can be counterproductive, right? Imagine uh, if the government sets, uh, 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 say, 6%, uh, 5%, it's, we will see whether 5% is realistic or not, but when, when, the, when, the, when the target is too ambitious, it's not a, um, you know, the, 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 the plan actually, the target actually has a lot of the teeth because uh, central government will uh, motivate the local government and state firms actually to implement the plan. So, so that's where actually ambitious plan actually gonna have uh, consequences.
uh, when local officials felt the pressure, actually they would have to uh, find ways to, uh, you know, uh, uh, gear up the investment. And uh, before a new growth engine uh, is uh, uh, constructed, right? So there, I am actually quite a bit worried, actually. Uh, local officials might be uh, pressured to uh, restart the, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the failing engine, right, again. So that actually might make things even worse because that means uh, a local government actually might have to uh, uh, sell more land and uh, actually use more land-based uh, uh, debt financing uh, to take on more infrastructure, large-scale infrastructure projects and all of that. Actually, at this point, actually, the real estate sector actually needs some time to gradually digest the inventories, right? And uh, to grow out of the, I think it's a, it's possible to grow out of the problem, but the growing out of the problem will take time. That means uh, the, the, this will need the patience, right? So patience is not uh, in the public, but also uh, patience of the policymakers, uh, which actually will be even harder, right? So, so policymakers want to set the ambitious goals uh, for all sorts of reasons. So, so I think uh, this actually might be, in my mind, perhaps, uh, 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 perhaps a bigger problem than real estate itself. Thank you so much, uh, Wei. I think you substantially answered the remaining question we have. Oh, really? uh, several uh, members of the audience asked um, uh, to what extent China can grow out of the problem. Um, and uh, I believe Fu Bing Su and uh, Yu Zhang uh, both asked um, whether the current international political environment, supply chain tension, um, and uh, slowing export growth in addition to demography uh, will make China's ability to grow out of the, uh, the problem uh, of current debt situation much harder or worse than uh, Japan's experience, um, especially as low growth is uh, politically sensitive for the government, as one attendee uh, commented. Uh, Wei, if you have any uh, further comments on, on this angle, um, otherwise, perhaps Paul and Takeo, if you would like to comment more on China's ability to grow out of its um, uh, debt conditions compared to Japan's experience, or if there are alternative growth engines that might be realistic. Um, so Wei, I don't know if you'd like to add any on this point. Uh, perhaps I, I can wait uh, for Paul and uh, Taku. Uh, to, to say something. Okay. Uh, Takeo, would you like to, uh, Paul, would you like to comment? Oh, well, maybe just, yeah, thanks very much, Richard. Just very quickly, again, when, you know, when I've been using this, this uh, term of growing out of the problem, um, you know, I was using in the context of, you know, Japan circa 1995, let's say, when it was very, very clear to everybody that there was this hidden hole in the banking system and there was this excess debt and you know the, the market analysts knew this everybody did their own npl calculations i can remember doing them and coming up with my numbers i mean based on really publicly available data and yet the policymakers was basically took the approach of you know we've got this um we'll just use forbearance we'll guarantee the deposits that means there won't be a run on the banking system we won't require strict disclosure we'll let the banks pretend that they don't have such a big uh, heap of non-performing loans, but get to the end of the year, we'll give them five years. The plan was five years initially, that turned into 10. And, but at the end of the year, we'll just admit there's more NPLs than we admitted last year. They'll write them off and that use that year's profits to, to, to sort of you know, offset that and just keep doing that. That was very counterproductive because the, you know, the, the debt overhang was too big monetary policy was not working. There were also errors on the fiscal policy side. And one of the things that happened, and I just em emphasize this point, um, is that uh, Japanese policymakers lost their credibility. And credibility is very important for policy of all kinds. And it, again, it's touched on a moment before, a little bit earlier, but you know, in the early 1990s, the sort of 
uh, literature, the discussion of Japan, kind of centered on this idea that industrial policy had been very effective. And the Ministry of uh, International Trade, MITI, the International uh, Ministry of International Trade and Industry and the Minister of Finance, they couldn't do no wrong. They walked on water. And um, so they had a lot of policy credibility. I mean, I think what happened in the 1990s was they spent that credibility. And uh, market participants, maybe the public more generally, started to lose confidence in policymakers. Once that happens, policy itself becomes less effective, and it's sort of like a downward, a negative spiral. So, you know, I'm not sure, you know, exactly what the situation is in China as we speak. My reading of the data is that, you know, China today is not in a 1995 Japan style situation. Um, but could it get there? Um, and if, you know, if we, we continue to have this very frothy real estate markets, if it continue to be credit creation by the banks, sort of to the people who buy the land off the local governments, and if there's all this kind of uh, consensus that we have to keep land prices elevated because if they fall, local governments will be in trouble, then you're sowing the seeds of something that ultimately could turn into um, a bubble that's going to burst. That's when, if China thinks 10 years in the future when this happens, if it happens, they can grow out of the problem. Um, I just don't feel, I don't think that will happen. I think that could be a very bad outcome for, for, for China. So again, this idea of can you grow out of the problem um, you know, is really very context specific and it needs to be diagnosed carefully uh, on that basis. What worked in one period, you know, may not be the right policy mix in another. And just, just to add well, one, one more thing, um, the one problem or one failure of the Japanese policymakers or the Japanese uh, population in general was that they continued to overestimate the gross potential in 1990s, 2000, and 2000s. They always uh, overpredicted the growth. Mm -hmm. And so there was a hope for growth uh, solves something, and but but it, it didn't happen. So uh, it's a very, I, I think the one lesson is uh, you, you may be better off containing your expectation for the growth coming back. And, and Richard and Jin, can I just add one little analytical point that we're talking about growth almost as if it's exogenous, but of course it's endogenous. In other words, the policy measures that are taken itself themselves can have a negative impact on growth. Um, that's that negative feedback loop. And again, that's where policymakers need, really need to kind of think through these things very, very carefully when they're deciding on the policy mix. So I wonder, actually, Takio, when you mentioned that uh, the the focus by the Japanese policymaker uh, always tended to be overly optimistic, it's because of a, a psychological or behavioral reason, or it's actually political driven, right? So when you're on the job, you need to be confident, right? <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, probably political. They needed to. Uh, they needed to show. Uh, bigger number than they believe i guess okay that, that's, right. that's so, a part so, of it okay so i guess uh, there, there will be a similar kind of uh, forces of, at the play as well <laughs> in china as well as in many other countries um yeah so so i mean clearly i, I this is a, a big worry right so um uh with uh with uh, uh I think actually, uh, Taki also mentioned that, you know, a Japanese economy uh, tend to actually also uh, have a lot of uh, uh, government interventions, right? So much more so than the US clearly. I think uh, China is even more so, right? I mean, because uh, uh, China still has a, a socialist, uh, officially a socialist uh, government, right? So, <laughs> so, so, and uh, clearly, uh, um, uh, the the Chinese Communist Party uh, view that um, uh, its intervention uh, in the economy is essential uh, for the for the growth and also. Uh, for many other things, so so I think uh, this is <laughs> that, that's why sort of uh, 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 I think uh, uh, this hybrid economy actually going to maintain 
uh, will stay in China for a long while. I think Japan actually uh, gradually actually um, you know uh, transformed itself more and more to a uh, open economy, right? O open market economy, so free market economy, where actually government uh, interventions uh, uh, gradually reduced over over time, right? But but one one thing we should worry is uh the Paul mentioned the industrial policy, industrial policy uh, seems to be back now in Japan and oh, yeah? also okay. in Chi in China too. China actually no. follow the Japan in uh, the community. Yeah, and uh, also in the I, I, I would I would back in the U.S. Yeah, I was going to say Tokyo. I would add the U.S. to that list yeah. as well. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> High tech industry clearly. So government <laughs> intervention is uh, increasing everywhere. All yeah. three following yeah. the same path. But, but of course, China is not just about the industrial policy. Actually, pretty much uh, all policy, right? So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, 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 so the government intervention uh, went way beyond that. So, so in fact, actually, real estate the sector is a good example where, right? So the, the government just used to be there, right? So I actually want to uh, mention a bit. Actually, Paul mentioned earlier about this, uh, you know, uh, this uh, uh, forcing local government to sell land to fund itself uh, as uh, as uh, fundamentally problematic. Actually, it was not the case early on. I think back in the '90s and perhaps in the 2000s, this was actually a good model. Because this is a way to address uh, a fundamental agency problem of local government, right? Local governments clearly play a very big role, uh, you know, uh, in in in, in uh, urban development, right? So they have to build the infrastructure, they have to, you know, build the blueprint for local business development and so on. So forcing them to sell land basically tie their sort of performance to local growth, local development, right? In that sense, actually, uh, it's uh, incentive compatible in many ways. But of course, I think eventually sort of maybe this model has been overused. Uh, eventually, when local governments start to use a lot of debt and debt uh, uh, based on real estate, then this changed the nature because uh, uh, eventually it becomes too important to fail. And if it cannot fail, then it's not the performance measure anymore, right? So, so, so I think uh, that that's sort of where sort of uh, 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 where the nature changed. Right. Uh, Richard is telling uh, me that perhaps uh, we, we should uh, 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 conclude at some point. Yes, well, thank you so much for all three of our, our wonderful panelists, uh, Takeo, Wei, and Paul, uh, for your excellent remarks and, and very insightful discussions and answers uh, to our questions. Um, this concludes our discussion this evening. Um, I, I believe we all, and uh, hopefully everyone in the audience, learned a great deal about uh, the conditions in uh, financial sectors and real estate sectors in both Japan and China. Uh, and um, hopefully policymakers watching this discussion and similar discussions will, will be learning as well. Um, thank you, everyone who joined us this evening, uh, and have a good rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.